Hello, everybody. Welcome to OpenCV Weekly Webinar. Today, we have Brandon Miner, who is the CEO of Tangram Vision, with us. And we are going to talk about sensors for sensors. This is the second part of the series. We had a very a lively discussion last time about various kinds of sensors uh, in a car. Um, and we will continue that discussion, some, something about calibration, et cetera, in this uh, webinar. And also with us is Phil Nelson, as always. He's the content manager at OpenCV. Um, hi, Phil. Hey, everybody. As a reminder, at the end of the webinar, we will be doing a Q&A with the audience. Please use Zoom's Q&A functionality to ask your question at any time during the presentation or discussion, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. That's great. And we will also have a question uh, at the end of the webinar. And if you answer that question, the first person who answers that question correctly receives an Oak One. So this today's prize is Oak One. That's uh, OpenCV AI kit uh, without the depth version, but it's still a very powerful uh, camera, smart camera that you can program using Python. So that's what we will give away. So watch out for the question. Uh, most of the questions, most of the, most of the time we ask something that has been presented in the presentation. So keep your eyes open. Uh, now let's uh, welcome Brandon and let's start with an introduction, Brandon. Could you uh, introduce yourself just a little bit of, of your background before we dive into the slides? Sure. Um, hi, hi, everybody. My name is Brandon Miner. I'm the CEO of Tangram Vision. We're doing DevOps for perception. Um, so, you know, what that kind of means is robots and um, vision enabled devices are complicated machines and getting the data plumbing right is important, something we'll talk about today. Um, so my personal background, you know, I did a lot of self-driving car research in my PhD, left my PhD to do computer vision work, um, and calibration has really become one of my passions, which is not common. <laughs> Again, I don't think anybody can really say that. So you know, we'll dive into it today. I'm pretty excited for it. That's great. So let's uh, let's get started with the slides. Uh, we have some very interesting um, discussion. We are going to have a very interesting discussion about uh, sensors and how calibration works, etc. Yeah. So let me share my screen here. Get this going. Um, good to go. Yep. Uh, All right. It's showing two slides. It is. There we go. Great. Now it looks. How does that look? Yep. Yeah. That's what happens when you're on Linux. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's dive into it. Sensors for your sensors part two. Um, this is part two, which means there was a first part, which was my first talk. Um, you could say they're artificially connected. That's fine. But <laughs> I think they uh, meld together pretty solidly. Um, so just to recap of part one, right? We asked the questions, why are there so many freaking sensors? And we started with this car. So, you know, we had radar, we had LIDAR, we had cameras, we had ultrasound. We probably have a couple of IMUs on there. And these systems are so complicated, but there's no turning back from it at this point, right? They all compensate for each other. They all have a role. They're all important. So having them all there is, is a necessity. We need more out of our machines. We need more sensors. And we took that, you know, we took a um, electromagnetic view of these things and saw exactly why these sensors compensate for one another. You know, you have visible, then you have the ultraviolet, then you have the infrared that give more information out of the visible. Then you have radar and LIDAR, which compensate for those as well through distance and time. You have to stitch all these together to make a to make a machine. Um, so you know the moral of that talk was there is really no going back from this. Sensors are so ubiquitous and cheap and powerful at this point that there is no downside to having more sensors on your machine other than trying to stitch them together, which is still a, a huge pain um, in in the sense. Brandon, do you have a blown up version, a bigger version of the picture on the left? Um, I don't, but I can do that officially. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, because that, that's a very, yeah, that's a very important slide. And you can see here that uh, RGB camera sensors, they have different uh, capabilities, different range, different resolution, et cetera. 
And uh, there are other sensors also, right? This one gives a very a clear picture. The light blue is the camera sensor. And you can see that it does cover a lot of areas, but it doesn't go far enough. The resolution of the camera at that point becomes uh, really small, right? Or you may have to use sometimes, uh, for example, in Tesla, they use uh, from the same, uh, approximately the same location, they use uh, two different cameras. One is wide angle and one is a very uh, small angle, right? So, uh, and then you can see that radar and LIDAR, they go farther away. And then there are things like ultrasonic, uh, ultrasonic uh, sensors, which are literally, they have a very short range, but they are to make sure that you don't bump into, uh, you know, where you're backing up and things like that. Uh, they don't, you don't bump into stuff. So all these sensors are absolutely necessary. There is no way uh, of getting around them. So what do we do? And these sensors need to be, need to work together. They, they need to be aligned together. The output need to be registered with each other. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the sensor fusion problem is, is not going away. Yeah. I mean, if any of you live in, in San Francisco, when I'm in San Francisco, I see at least three self-driving cars a day, um, parked or unparked. And it's, it's easy to see, you know, exactly what they're, what they're trying to get away with here. They're, they're huge machines. The computation is enormous. Um, yeah, and Elon but, Musk says that you know uh, cameras are enough, but you know there are conditions like fog and other things where you want something else. Uh, you need a collection of sensors, right? And I don't even know whether the current set of sensors would be enough for full autonomy. You do need something that works in a, a lot of conditions. Mm -hmm. um, which again, see the first talk, we we dive into it quite a bit. Um, so let's see, fit, oh, I did a bad thing. Nope, this is what happens. All right, here we go. Um, I have learned. So that was the first talk. You know, we were just talking about how many sensors there are and why they're all actually needed. Um, but today we're gonna transition to the bigger problem, in my opinion, um, which is stitching them all together, right? This, what Satya just said, the sensor fusion problem. Um, which has not been solved as of yet. So, you know, data plumbing, in my opinion, stitching these all together is actually a problem of calibration. This is why I'm so excited about the problem of calibration. Um, and I say problem because again, it has not been solved yet to my knowledge. Um, calibration really gives you the tools necessary to understand your data at a fundamental level, no matter the sensor it's coming from. So, you know, say the cameras on that car, we're going to need to know how light bends through the lens. That's called its intrinsics, um, exactly the profile of the camera itself. We need to know the extrinsics, which is its relation to other sensors on the machine. Um, extrinsics can be spatial, you know, you can have two sensors distance, you need to know how to register them, but it could also be temporal, right? You have, you have connections between these sensors and you need to know exactly how they differ in time so that you can better judge uh, their performance. And then intrinsics and extrinsics together lead to calibration validation. So what that really means is you're going through time and you need to see, you need to make sure that the calibration you had at one point is the same at another point, is the same at another point. And if that's not true, then your system as you've designed it will mess up. Like you don't have the same power that you had before to do all these things because your understanding of your machine has changed, right? So it's this understanding that calibration gives you and why I think it's such a valuable tool, such an underestimated tool in industry. And just to give a little bit more flavor on what these intrinsics are because most people are familiar with uh, a camera, we can uh, pick the example of a camera. Like for a camera, the intrinsics would be the focal length of the camera, even though you know the camera says, the manufacturer says that the focal length is such and such, that may not be the exact focal length. They may be off by, um, by some percentage. So, and for these kinds of applications, we need to be 100% sure that we are as close um, because we are, we are using these cameras not for photography, right? We are using it as a sensor. We need to estimate things, estimate uh, some data from that uh, thing. So we need to make sure that all the uh, intrinsics are perfect. So focal length is one intrinsic. 
The second thing could be that the plane of the camera, it may not be centered. It may not be centered at the exact center pixel. So that offset we need to account for. And then the lens that we are using, it may be causing some distortion. So there are a lot of uh, lens distortion parameters that come in when we are doing uh, camera intrinsics. So those are the you know high level uh, camera intrinsics. And then if you look about, if you talk about extrinsics, we also need to know how this camera is connected is connected to other cameras. For example, if you have a stereo pair, what is the relationship of one camera with respect to the other? So you need the rotation and the translation between these two cameras. So we could say that those are the ex extrinsics of the camera. It is the relation of relationship of the camera with respect to some global or the world coordinates. So that's uh, roughly, but obviously these intrinsics and extrinsics have different uh, meanings when we are talking about different uh, sensors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we'll actually get into that in a little, in a little bit, trying to figure out exactly what this means for different sensors. Um, but the story is the same for, for sensor modalities. You need to understand how it works internally, how it relates externally, and how it changes over time. Yep. So, you know, that brings us to pipelines. Um, there are so many data types and so many ways to move data around that this actually becomes a, an engineering problem. Um, and when our perception pipeline explodes, who do we call? You know, data in so many ways has um, analogies to, to plumbing, right? You have pipelines, you have data flow, um, and engineers can be considered the plumbers of such things, but, but where are the data plumbers? Um, the problem is that, that that position doesn't really exist in industry. Calibration engineers are very few and far between in industry. Um, you can find a little bit more in academia, but the, the study and implementation of these data pipelines for sensors and perception um, is not currently a, a job. It's not currently a role. I just um, like to chime in and say how disappointed I am that you missed the opportunity to put Mario on this slide. Ah, you know, I'm a Mario silhouette and I, <laughs> and I am sorry, Phil, I have no excuse. <laughs> I'll, I'll forgive you this time. I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, that is one of the fascinating questions that I have yet to answer in my time in industry is like why this isn't more of a um, big deal. It just seems like a big deal, <laughs> especially with these sensors, sensor systems that are just so complicated. Um, right now, it takes 50 generalists, you know, to, to understand this problem. Um, so we'll be digging into that in the, in the rest is of the it, talk. Is it, is it because of the complexity of what is involved? Because if you want to have a calibration engineer, uh, does it not mean that you need to have solid knowledge about all these different sensors, right? Uh, is it an expertise problem, do you think? I think it is, it is an experience and expertise problem. Um, but at the same level, I don't think the problem has been contextualized in this way. Oh. Um, because if you're working with a autonomous vehicle, for instance, like an RC car, mm -hmm. you might have a LIDAR on there. You might have some cameras, but as soon as you you know, understand as soon as you get the data pipeline going a little bit, you start working on the cooler, higher level stuff. Yeah. Right. Because it's the cooler, higher level stuff that you're really building the machine for. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, the data pipeline itself still has not been solved and it turns into a big issue. So I think it's just the conceptualization that's also half of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a great segue. Like, let's, let's talk about how we do this right now. Um, I have illustrated the car of the future, as I see in my mind. <laughs> you know, it's pretty easy. It has a front cam, a back cam, lighter on the top, IMU. Again, if you're walking through San Francisco, you probably see something a little bit like this, except add five more of everything. Um, so let's get into how right now, given the tools we have in industry, we would solve this calibration problem. Awesome, OpenCV provides the first answer. <laughs> uh, camera calibration is, is usually done through the calibration dance, uh, AKA James method. So you'll print out this checkerboard that has known 
uh, square sizes, known metrics. You move it around um, and see how, again, light bends, how the checkerboard deforms around this lens. And then at the end of that process, you just let the math run, gives you the parameters, the intrinsics, and then you say, is it good enough? It's good enough. And you're done. Um, it's popular for- board has to be real easy. flat too. Real, real It has flat. to be really flat, yes. Um, because what you're really doing is understanding the object space, you know, exactly how these things are lined up metrically in Euclidean space versus the way it was, the light is affected in the lens. So if you don't have that exact and flat, you will get wrong parameters, but assuming that everything is good, you know, this method is actually one of the best, uh, one of the simplest. It's popular for its ease of use. And you can get the intrinsics as Satya was talking about, you know, the focal length, the principal point, the center offset, um, and the extrinsics. You know, you can have two cameras and figure out their relation to one another in one process. So this is actually a super cool, um, simple method that you can find in OpenCV. You can also find it in the Ross library. Um, it works really well for what we're doing. Right, and uh, uh, I mean, uh... If you're trying to do build something industrial, I would uh, I would advise that you also look at the charuko pattern, mm -hmm. which is uh, you know these these uh, black uh, regions they replace it with uh, aruko kind of markers, and uh, so that pattern is more stable. It produces better results. And if you want to do something cool, you can also use uh, the circular patterns that. Uh, that's also part of OpenCV. Uh, that looks mm -hmm. very cool that, oh, you're not using a checkerboard. Look, I'm using these circles. And it works very well as well. Uh, so those are the two things that you can uh, check out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty familiar with circles. Um, I would recommend Faruko, yep. though. It's, uh, it's a pretty powerful, powerful tool. Um, but you know, at the very end of the day, if you have a checkerboard, it, it works, yep. which is one it of works. the magic. Yeah. Um, so we have cameras, we have our cameras. Now we have to use the information we had in our cameras to inform our LIDAR calibration. And LIDAR intrinsics are a bit different. So, you know, they also bend, they're bending light, they're figuring out the reflection of the light, um, but it has to be in reference not to, you know, light and dark patterns, um, but in reference to, to distance, to metrics. So what you do for LIDAR calibration is actually find a flat plane. You can identify a flat plane and um, register it against the beam reflection that you have from the LIDAR. So from most factory calibrated LIDAR, it'll be pretty close, but you won't have it per like perfectly flat. And what you want to do with the intrinsics calibration of a LIDAR is figure out how to make your beams perfectly flat you know, or perfectly shaped to your calibration target. Um, and, but really, but really that's it. I mean, getting the, the spin time and the, the power down, you're good to go. Um, but there is also the extrinsic, uh, of the LIDAR calibration. Uh, the LIDAR needs to be uh, registered with the camera, right? Like on my right. phone, uh, the phone has a LIDAR iPhone 12, uh, pro max, whatever it is, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it has a LIDAR and, uh, also, uh, cameras. But if you want to texture map the camera data onto the LIDAR data, then you need a perfect registration, right? Um, mm -hmm. So th for those reasons, you need uh, extrinsic calibration also between your LIDAR uh, and other cameras, maybe other sensors, et cetera. That's exactly right. And you use the camera calibration that you found. You, you inherently have to rely on the camera calibration you found here Mm -hmm. to inform the LIDAR extrinsics that you find here, right? So these, these processes build on each other. Mm. Uh, that's an important point because for our last sensor on our module, IMU, we probably need to register to both LIDAR and camera. And so now we're relying on the results of both of those calibration processes to find the IMU extrinsics as well. Um, so, you know, just to touch on it a bit, IMU is a bit different. Um, it's a continuous time model. So you, you move your sensor through time and see how it drifts, how it behaves. Um, IMU intrinsics are the scale and the bias of the motion and the position in space as it moves. Um, and again, in order to really get a handle on this, you need the 
information from both your LIDAR and your camera to understand your complete system. So we find that you know, through all our, our calibration process for this car, we've actually been building on top of each of these processes, daisy chaining our information one by one by one um, to get to a fully calibrated machine. Right. right. And IM use are basically uh, sensors that tell you the orientation of, uh, of a device that they are connected to. Right? Yeah, that's right. I, for, for context, it's the position and the acceleration and rotation. Right. 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 Yeah. So they're pretty tricky, but you have everybody has them in their phones. They're very used. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we found that what we wanted was this calibration process that stacked on one another and gave us a great uh, picture of our data for this vehicle. But what we got was something very iffy, um, which you might not have seen. So this is one of the unpredictable things about calibration right now in industry is that the tools we have basically say that the calibrations we've derived are absolute. It's like, this is the picture of your camera. This is what your LiDAR did. Um, but what it, it is in reality is that there's a lot of uncertainty that goes through this, both on the data side and the mathematics. So, you know, it could be a blurry camera image. It could be that you misclassified a plane on your LiDAR and it wasn't quite flat. It could be that your IMU just had erratic motion, but whatever it was, that error was baked into your calibration so that by the end of this daisy chaining of events, um, what we got is actually very uncertain. We don't actually understand the car. Right. And uh, actually, the, the, another uh, real world analogy here is um, you know, the game of telephone where you have a series of people and uh, the first person is told something uh, while the others cannot hear it. And the person needs to repeat that sentence to the other person. And you keep doing that after say 15 uh, people or so, it's a completely different message. Uh, what the person said was completely different from what the person uh, in the end got. So when you're trying to calibrate also, if you're calibrating these things independently uh, or two at a time, let's say you are calibrating a stereo pair, but there are hundred uh, sensors or hundred cameras in the scene and you're doing two at a time, then uh, it, the errors, very small errors, they will percolate and you will see that, oh, it doesn't make sense. You know, the 100 camera system is not the same as calibrating. Calibrating the 100 camera system is not the same as calibrating two cameras at a time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to have a global calibration in some sense so that all of these errors are taken into account while, uh, while it calibrates everything, right? Um, so, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it, it's almost like the instructor in the telephone game, if they tell you independently uh, the same <laughs> the same phrase, then you uh, you know even if it is not even if it is noisy, you can actually piece together all the uh, information that people have independently uh, heard, and uh, then come up with what what the actual uh, probably is right instead of this uh, serial game of telephone. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and that is, um, oh, that is coming up, is what I meant okay. to say. <laughs> Excellent point. Um, but right now, but right now, that's not quite the case. Um, like I said before, you know, there's a lot of instance in academia where this is true, where you can find you know, larger tools to get this out. But right now for industry, it's a different, it's a different thing. Like every sensor is still calibrated one at a time. You know, you're dependent on the last results. This er truth and error question becomes really big. And so right now the calibration is patchwork and painful. That's, that's, the, that's the whole theme. But this patchwork painful calibration process has not been solved by industry by making calibration better. So instead, what these larger um, you know, perception-based products do is that they make compromises other places to avoid the calibration problem entirely. And so you can think of you know, think reducing the feature set, you know, getting rid of some sensors, 
easy to do, you know, but you're going to restrict your abilities, making difficult demands on the user. So making sure that once it's out in the field, you have to calibrate instead of calibrating, you know, in factory or, or what have you. Um, changing the industrial design so that these problems mm -hmm. just are less tractable or more tractable. Um, this, this one is most painful because you've probably been in a year two of development and then you're like, we just can't solve this. <laughs> this is bad. Um, and then the last one is just buying more expensive sensors. Generally more expensive sensors have understood behavior, which is something you'd like in your machine. So anything to avoid calibrating. It's really anything to avoid calibrating all these sensors. Um, industry will do. So um, the just to just to give uh, you know some more uh, real world flavor, uh, we uh, we have worked with two clients recently whose product is ready. They say that the product is ready, except that the calibration takes a long time. You know the procedure they are using for calibration is uh, is painful for the user, so they cannot release the product yet. So this is how important the calibration is. Something let's say if the calibration takes five minutes versus uh, thirty seconds, that that's a huge difference, right? And that can stall the development of your product or the release of your product, right? And it's not uh, just the calibration, right? It's actually mm -hmm. quite a lot of work to get down a calibration procedure from say five minutes uh, to uh, less than 30 seconds. Oh yeah. Um, and especially if, you know, vision is a big part of your system. If calibration's out and you have users um, doing it themselves, that's, that's a huge mm -hmm. sticking point because right. The users aren't necessarily trained in how to do that. Yep. Leaving it up to them can can be drastic. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely uh, something Brandon and I had a lot of shared experience with at Occipital. Yeah. Uh, the calibration app, which I I think the current version of it, I actually designed like some storyboarded memory serves. And that's a great example of I think calibration being done particularly well. It's and it's still a hard process. <laughs> Don't, don't uh, let's pat ourselves on the back a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Very good job, us. Yeah. Um, but no, that's that's a great example. That is, you know, that sensor is relied upon to do some very cool stuff, and users need to know how to do it. Um, it is done. It's done well. But the process getting there took years. So that's just an idea of how complicated this problem is. Um, and that's because we had to do it. Right. Again, in industry, if you don't have to, you usually don't you right. usually avoid it. It's somebody else's problem. Um, but my, you know, my kind of thesis is here. Thesis here is that we can't avoid the problem. Things, sensors are getting so cheap and so good that this combinatorics issue won't go away. Things are just going to get bigger and better. Uh, we need to figure out a way to solve that. So, you know, kind of as Satya was saying before, we need to take a more holistic view of sensor systems um, where we don't really daisy chain these things. We don't do them one at a time, but we actually include as much data as we can into the process initially um, to make sure that we're incorporating as much as we can. So, you know, this can be a LiDAR stream, a camera stream for sure, but it can also be GPS data. You know, it could also be supplementary sensor system data where we know that it will inform these other things through time, um, which we couldn't do with our daisy change processes, right? Um, and most importantly, at the end of this process, we need to make sure that our calibration is presented to us with uncertainty. This seems counterintuitive because you'd wanna be as certain as possible, but actually the processes we had before were giving us half truths. You know, it wasn't lying, but it wasn't telling you how certain it really was. It was just saying, this is right. Um, that certainty can actually be a super powerful tool later on um, when we get, you know, strange data points. We're like, how does this fit? Well, our calibration was so uncertain that if we deviate a little bit over here, now this works. Right. Um, and we can figure that out for our whole sensor system. Yeah, and for the, for, if you take a very sim, uh, simple step of the calibration process, right, let's say you're calibrating using a checkerboard pattern, 
then there is uncertainty in the determination of the corners also. We don't realize it, right? Uh, but there is uncertainty. Let's say you're using a slightly blurry image, then the corner was not detected properly, right? It, it, there is uncertainty how sharp the corner, where exactly the corner is located. And here we are not talking about pixel level accuracy. We are talking about sub pixel level accuracy, right? So you need to know inside the pixel, where is the center or where is this corner? Uh, and if the image is slightly blurry, there is an uncertainty and you can throw away that uncertainty and say, oh, we don't, uh, this is the answer. But it turns out that if you actually keep that uncertainty later, when you're trying to do this um, global optimization, you can incorporate that uncertainty uh, saying that, oh, you know, with this sensor, I was not certain about the focal length. And so if things don't match up properly, when I try to calibrate it in a globally uh, global way, then I will penalize, I will actually uh, consider this sensor that this calibration that I had done, uh, I would take the uncertainty into account. And so I will not weigh it as high. Uh, it's, it's like voting, right? I'm not going to vote this person's uh, suggestion of what its focal length is uh, because the uncertainty is high, right? So we can think about it in those ways when all these, uh, all these systems also return uncertainty. When we are doing global optimization, we can account, we can take the uncertainties into account uh, to do the optimization properly. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I don't want to discredit those in the field. There are processes that do this right now, um, but they are relegated to academia for the most part. Um, and the labs that are doing this research are fairly small. Um, they, they don't have a lot of talent to go around. Um, so the tools to do these things are currently restricted um, to those making products, unless you hire from the, you know, the few groups that do this. So um, it's, it's an urgent, it is an urgent need in the field right now to have something like this. But Thankfully, this problem has actually been tackled in the past, uh, which I think is super fascinating because as somebody who's been in this field for a while, it, it didn't really dawn on me until you know, this year um, that these older techniques could be done uh, in this way. But my, in my mind, the solution to this holistic view of calibration is actually lies in bundle adjustment, um, which, is, which is nuts, right? Flexible bundle adjustment, I think, is the answer to, to this problem. Um, it's... It's crazy because bundle adjustment has been around in computer vision for a while. Um, bundles can refer to either, you know, the bundle of rays that come out of the camera center. So you can think of, you know, from a camera to an object as a ray, and you have a bunch of those. That's a bundle of rays. And then you figure out both the objects and the camera at the same time. Um, that, is, that is a bundle as well. Um, but really, bundle adjustment is just a way to put all of this into the same framework and solve it at the same time. Um, the reason it's surprising is that bundle adjustment is used currently in computer vision, mostly for camera data, like I said. Um, but it can be extended to a ton of other data systems uh, and sensors. Um, photogrammetry, if you're familiar with that field, or metrology, um, did this first. There are some bundle adjustment papers from the 1970s that go into this in incredible detail. Um, but the things that they expand upon specifically are, are fascinating. So they don't just get the calibration parameters for your cameras. You don't just get the intrinsics and the extrinsics, but you actually understand the uncertainty and precision of those measurements. You understand the um, uncertainty and precision of your data put in. So what you were saying, the checkerboard corners, right? You would be able to solve for the checkerboard corner uncertainty as well. Um, and you're able to take in the supplementary data. So if you had these GPS um, you know, marks that could help your camera positioning, you can effectively fold that in pain-free. Um, it's fascinating that all of this was done so long ago. And see, uh, computer vision employs these techniques, but not with the right rigor. Um, at least in the tools that we use. So one of the th things that I attribute that to is that computer vision 
was developed in a resource constrained time with a ton of data needed to process. And so when you were just thinking about these bundle adjustment operations, which are just basically huge matrices, thousands of thousands of numbers, right? And trying to do that at once, um, you effectively couldn't. So there were tons of shortcuts um, to get around that. But those shortcuts have been embedded into the engineering culture of computer vision to the point where the tools that we have now rely on them, um, which is detrimental. Right. And uh, just to, I mean, some of the viewers uh, may be um, uh, maybe beginners and for their uh, benefit, we can, uh, you know, we can think about a bundle adjustment problem as let's say you're looking at this one point, right? And this one point in space, if you look at uh, it from three different cameras, the rays uh, from the three cameras, the lines that they would all intersect at this point, right? That's by construction that I'm looking at this point. But if you try to solve the reverse problem, you take three calibrated cameras, um, and then you try to look at the same point from th the three cameras. Let's say you take two cameras at a, at a time, it would, you can estimate the depth of that point. So you may get the depth at this location. Now you take the second two pro uh, camera, the second pair of cameras, and it would not return the depth at exactly the same location because of all kinds of little problems, right? So uh, the same point will not actually get to a single point when you take two cameras at a time. So you may actually end up with a you know ball of points. You know you have different estimates where this point can actually lie, right? And if you naively uh, do it, you could say that oh take two cameras at a time and then uh, simply average the results that you get for the depth of this point. And that's your real one. Uh, that's, uh, that actually will not produce very good results. It's, it's an okay thing to do, but uh, in real life, what you do is you try to solve the global optimization problem where all three cameras are involved. They are all three cameras that are involved and you try to find the estimate of this so that you minimize the, uh, the error for all three cameras simultaneously. Not only that, you also question the intrinsic parameters of the camera and the extrinsic uh, calibration between them so that you try to find, uh, you try to calibrate the parameters uh, as well as the location of uh, this point simultaneously, right? And that's what bun uh, techniques like uh, bundle adjustment allow you to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you want to know more about it, you know, um, people use uh, the Ceres solver, which, uh, uh, you know, it's a very beautiful library for doing some of these things. It's an optimization library, but people use it for bundle ad adjustment a lot. You can try that out also. Mm -hmm. yeah. They must um, have some examples in the documentation. Yeah, I, would, I was about to say, it, getting examples can be, can be a little difficult because bundle adjustment is fairly complicated. Yes. Um, mathematically, but that was a great explanation. It's it's really boiling down, you know, figuring out these uncertainties through the the variables that you're provided. And for camera systems, that's the intrinsics and the extrinsics and the object space. Um, and you know, there are calibration methods that rely on this currently, which is why some people might be rolling their eyes uh, at the suggestion. But you know, having this holistically for one to end sensors for big machines is something I haven't seen yet. Um, and I think, you know, even building on this mathematics could be a, a huge value add. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a great segue because there are some tools right now. You know, I, I keep complaining about there aren't tools. There aren't tools. There actually are some tools trying to build upon this now. Um, so LIOSAM is an open source, um, you know, LIDAR um, IMU um structure from motion library and what it actually does is continuously refine the lidar and imu calibration as it goes so you know using this continuous time model kind of what the imu relies upon you can get better and better intrinsics and or extrinsics for for both of these things which just refines your map uh, amazing it's super cool um, but not a lot of libraries do this um what, what does uh LIO SAM stand for? Uh, is that an acronym? I think it's LIDAR inertial odometry. Okay. Okay. Structure something motion. Okay. 
uh, I know the uh, Lyo Sam authors are just gonna spam me with hate mail now. Um, but no, it's, it's something about odometry. Um, okay. So, oh, here, let's see. Um, and then MRCAL is actually a library. Um, let's see. From, oh, what is it? Oh, now I'm going to get dunked on by MRCAL too. Um, <laughs> uh, but it optimizes the camera parameters and the object space points, um, which is the coolest thing. So if you go to the website, MRCAL.secretsauce, they go into great detail about how this is done. So actually, you know, if you want to get a start on bundle adjustment, I would, I would point you to that page. Uh, they really do a good job of breaking it down. But what it does is instead of just finding the, the camera parameters, um, it actually incorporates warp in your checkerboard. So Phil, we were talking about the checkerboard needing to be completely flat. If your checkerboard isn't completely flat, oh. this system will tell you, this system will solve it um, and let you know, um, which is incredible. Again, this is one of the things that needs to be baked into these tools um, that is just now kind of be emerging uh, in industry. So, you know, credit to these libraries. They're doing some good stuff. Um, I actually think OpenCV has a checkerboard detector that incorporates uncertainty as well, um, but I haven't played with it yet. So kudos to there as well. Yeah, I, um, I like don't know 100% MRCAL website. I'm not 100% um, sure. It's uh, why MRCAL? It says, in essence, because all other tools are terrible if you care about accuracy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, not to, uh, not to be too harsh, but I guess that's the whole point of the talk. It's the accuracy and precision is just, is really where these things shine, um, and where the improvements need to be made. So, um, you know, we're hitting up on time. Uh, I think just to, to, to close it off really, you know, surprise, Tangram is working on this. <laughs> um, this is, you know, we, we realize this is a problem because of our personal expertise. The entire team has gone through this pain and the people we talk to have gone through this pain. And you know, people, you know, friends of friends are, are panicking about the, the multitude of sensors that they now have to put on their robots and how they're going to deal with that. Um, like, I, like I keep saying, data perception pipelines are, are here to stay. They're, they're gonna be complicated, they're gonna be rough, um, but solving this calibration um, idea from a holistic standpoint, really getting that software down, really understanding this from, you know, bundle adjustment and fundamentals um, will get us far. And so Tangram's excited to, to work on that problem. That's great. Please sign up for the SDK. So uh, yeah. will the SDK provide, uh, so a lot of people, uh, you know, our, our listeners, they may be uh, just vision engineers, right? They're just working with cameras. Will the SDK provide some easy ways to just calibrate multiple cameras? Uh, is that uh, if if I want to use only for cameras, right? I don't have a lidar, I don't uh, have other sensors, but I have uh, five cameras, right? Is mm -hmm. that something uh, the SDK will also provide? Easy. Yes. Okay. Yes, it will. Um, calibration is, you know, we're focused on you know plug and play sensors. We're focused on sensor pipelining, but. Calibration is first and foremost our, our priority. So whether you have a complicated system or a simple one, we want to make sure that that problem is solved. Got it. And uh, what kind of patterns uh, are there? Would you so there there are the, there's the detector problem, right? Uh, like we were working on uh, a pattern called deltile recently, and deltile pattern is it's a new pattern. It's you know triangular patterns instead of checkerboard pattern. So those oh. kinds of things, um, yeah, the idea is that, you know, triangular patterns, they have uh, more stable points uh, and under certain conditions that are actually true. Um, but my, my question was that, uh, would you have uh, a set of patterns that you would support for this calibration or how does it work? Yeah, so we're, we're actually working through that problem now. Um, okay. We're leaning towards Chiruko. Yeah. and April tags specifically yeah. because you know you can get good sub pixel measurements you know you can do some signal processing to understand that mm -hmm. um, but you can also see a part of the checkerboard and still get accurate metrics mm -hmm. um, this yeah. this ID is is really important right um, 
yeah so that's that's where we're leaning right now um, yeah. yeah and and uh, will it be uh, extensible in the sense that oh suppose i have my own pattern uh, can i write a detector so that now i can use all the tools you have but i i write my own detector so that i can add my own pattern now that's a great question. One of the most important things in our system is understanding the uncertainty. So, you know, if you write your own detector, you're, you know, taking that upon yourself um, okay. <laughs> in a way. So you have to write uh, that piece. Uh, that, exactly. Or at least admit that I don't know, uh, okay. right. <laughs> in which case we'll take that into account. Right. right. Yeah. But will, will it be extensible? Will people be able to write their own detectors as a plugin or something? I can't promise that, although I like the idea. I mean, democratizing this is, is priority number one. That's the mission of the company. Um, but who knows? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, census for your census part two. I know okay. that was a lot, yeah, but thank you. Yeah, we, are, we are ready to take uh, questions from people now. Yeah, uh, do we wanna do trivia first? Yeah, trivia, what's the question? Will, will you uh, tell them what they'll win, Satya? Right, so the person who answers the question first, uh, and by first we mean whatever shows up on Phil's, uh, <laughs> Phil's computer, because I'm not 100% sure you know, how these systems work, whether it will always show up correctly on everybody's computer. So whatever shows, whoever shows with the right answer on Phil's screen will get an Oak one for free. And uh, so that's, that's the giveaway. And OpenCV AI Kit uh, is basically a smart camera, which allows you to do neural inference on the device itself. So it will run a neural network on the device. It's fully programmable. Um, and it's been you know, uh, very popular with our uh, users. So yeah, uh, that's, definitely. that's the win. Awesome prize. Um, so uh, Brandon, would you mind unsharing your screen for the uh, Q&A part and trivia here? Awesome, thank you. So uh, earlier in the presentation, Brandon described what we colloquially call the calibration dance. What is the more official name for this method? <laughs> it's already there. <laughs> it looks like uh, P Sharma was the first one on my screen here. Very, very quick. Didn't even finish saying it. <laughs> so we'll uh, get in touch with you after the webinar to uh, figure out how to get you your free Oak One. Well done. That's so funny. So uh, just to, <clears throat> for historical reference, uh, Zheng Yu Zhang um, from Microsoft, he invented this method and it was uh, in MATLAB. One of the things people, there are two things actually, but which people, uh, initial adopters of OpenCV used. Uh, the first one, was for face detection. OpenCV was very popular for face detection because at that time, you know, real-time face detection was uh, uh, was uh, something that you couldn't find implementations of it, and OpenCV had one. And the other one was camera calibration. This method was really good. Yeah. Um, so, I guess we'll move on to Q and A here. Uh, first of all, I have. Uh, you know, uh, I'm an agent of chaos. So sure. I'd like to ask uh, Brandon and, and Stia both, do you have any tales of calibration gone horribly wrong for the audience? Oh, um. <laughs> I have a lot of tales of panic. So yeah, um, I guess one of the, you know, I've, I worked on, you know, the structure core which was the new version of the occipital structure sensor. And one of the coolest things with that machine was understanding the stereo pair, um, because there are two cameras here. And if you, you know, have the rotation off a little bit, it can go out. Um, and, <laughs> um, you know, we were getting urgent, urgent, I guess this isn't a calibration problem. We were getting urgent feedback from uh, our factory saying, you know, things are bad like calibrations aren't working at all. Um, and so once we actually understood the problem, it was that somebody had just removed the target. It was just gone. And so like the process of actually trying to understand this was pointless because it was getting like crazy mathematics and everything was wrong. So it was like, it was saying my, my eyes were like this and I was like, oh, I can't find anything. It's like, well, no, of course, come on. 
Um, so data is important, I think is the, the rule there. Yeah. That's tremendous. Uh, thanks for that. There's, um, there's an, another story. It's not a calibration story, but it's a fascinating story about uh, the 1966 uh, World Cup finals where uh, they were playing England versus Germany and there was a goal scored uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> an English researcher proved that um, that that actual goal was uh, not a goal. And he got so much hate mail based on multiple ca camera footage. Oh right? my God. Uh, but he did it much later, right? This 1966 uh, goal, you know, this happened, but then uh, later when they wanted to analyze when the things cooled down many years, like decades later, uh, he did this uh, analysis and showed that uh, it was not a goal based on the footage they had, um, multiple cameras, right? He got so much hate mail because he was uh, saying what the Germans were saying. <laughs> uh, oh, I have yeah. actually, on my, on my blog, um, I have uh, this story, um, you know, find maybe soccer, if you'll search for soccer on learnopencv.com, you will see that story. Yeah, people take their football very seriously over there. Right. Um, and they will love you for saying football. I know, I, I had to sneak that in there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to turn baby face here. Um, so a lot of people have asked uh, about where this will be uploaded. This will be put on our YouTube channel. I'll uh, drop the link in the chat here in a, in a minute. Uh, this, as well as every other episode, goes on the OpenCV uh, YouTube channel, which I'll drop the link for shortly. Um, a couple people asked uh, as well about uh, uh, where the slides for this will be. The slides are already uploaded on tangramvision.com's blog, which I'll link to in the chat now. Um, somebody asked, uh, several people asked about OpenCV, the library, uh, kind of more generally. One of those questions I think is a good one to answer here, uh, Satya, which was, uh, what are the most, uh, what are the contributions that OpenCV is looking for the most right now? Oh. Well, this like what, is so. What's the I'll, best way to contribute if they want to do code for OpenCV? Oh, it's not really code. There is something that is very close to my heart, but we have not been able to put a lot of energy into it, and that is packaging. So, uh, you know, it, when people want to build OpenCV from source, especially for Raspberry Pi and other uh, things, you know, it is a nightmare, right? It will take you two hours to uh, to, to do that, and. What I want, uh, and we have started doing this, we have started working off on NuGet. Uh, we want package managers, right? We want, sorry, packages for different platforms which are uh, pre-compiled binaries so that people can simply uh, install very quickly. So that's the biggest place to contribute. Uh, we are actively thinking about a project which will accomplish this but it's in early stages right now. We just started with the NuGet package. It's a uh, Google Summer of Code um, uh, project. And then uh, at Learn OpenCV, we developed an internal uh, you know, uh, installer for Windows also, but we need to do it for all the platforms. That's the biggest on my mind. Great, thanks for that. Um, somebody asked about, satellite sensors and uh, geolocation data. We didn't really talk about that, uh, Brandon. Does, does Tangram have a plan for incorporating geo data as well with uh, these calibrations of sensors? Yeah, so you know, using GPS, GNSS is actually a pretty common requirement for a lot of people we talk to. Um, the tricky part there is there are many protocols for doing such. Um, so it's not a matter of, are we going to do it? We absolutely are. Um, I think it's just a matter of what the priority lies, where the priorities lie there. Um, does it, you know, is it mostly for time synchronization, which is huge for GPS? Is it mostly for spatial data? Um, what protocol are you using? Um, these are things we're still kind of learning um, through the, S the SDK alpha. Um, and we're going to apply those those learnings later on. But yeah, absolutely, it's something we absolutely plan to do. Uh, several people have also thanks for that. Uh, several people have also asked about, uh, uh, understandably, OpenCV AI Kit and the Tangram SDK. Is that uh, like, is there a plan for that? Is it already supported? If people want to fuse multiple oaks together and stuff like that. Yeah, um, you know, we're hoping that the Tangram SDK is low enough level where these things can just plug in seamlessly. 
because at the end of the day, we're all about making the data pipeline work yeah. well. And once the data is out, uh, you do what you do. Um, so we absolutely, you know, if we can hook into an OpenCV pipeline, that'd be great. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, if people want to contact you, Brandon, and, and ask you questions about the horrible lies you've told during this webinar, um, <laughs> how do they, how can they best, uh, contact you where they wish they, uh, you? you can DM me on Twitter, B minor TX. Uh, I'm usually, usually there. That's probably the best way. And then. Or, or LinkedIn, absolutely. Cool. Um, and also uh, regarding timeline, like uh, how often are we get? Are you? Uh, what's the what's the timeline for inviting people to the the Tangram SDK Alpha, etc.? Yeah, great question. Um, so we actually just brought on our first cohort um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're looking for members for the second cohort now. So absolutely, you know, absolutely. Uh, if you have a vision enabled device. Or product that you would like to try out our SDK on, come on down. Go to tangramvision.com, put in your name. Great, um, appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> we're we're hitting up on time. You want to take us home, Satya? Yeah, thank you everybody for uh, for this uh, for uh, showing up on this webinar. We are, I mean, this I, I'm re I really enjoy these Thursday webinars because we get to talk uh, to some people, fantastic people, people like uh, Brandon Miner, uh, who educate us on various topics. And it's usually all very different topics, right? And uh, we also get to communicate with, uh, with OpenCV users and it's just fascinating. So thank you so much. Thank you, Brandon. And as always, uh, thank you, Phil. Yeah, thanks for coming everybody. As always, we will see you next Thursday, 9 a.m. sharp. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by ModelPlace.ai, the AI model marketplace by OpenCV. Learn more at ModelPlace.ai.